whatsoever. Uh, also, um, okay. uh, close your door <laughs> because I can hear uh, dogs barking last week. <laughs> Yeah, we've been having one barking all day. I hope he doesn't bother us. So. <laughs> it's something I haven't been able to get used to yet. I'm getting here, though. <laughs> <laughs> hey, guys, ready? Are you ready already? Did you got your uh, materials? Yeah, I'm ready to go. You want to pray? Yeah, maybe we can start. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, let us pray then. Yeah. Heavenly Father, once again, we thank you for uh, another opportunity for us to learn, to know you more, your word. And uh, we pray, Father God, that, uh, give us more uh, wisdom and understanding that we may be applied, Lord. We may apply this, whatever we learn in our ministry, in our church. And we do believe, Father God, that you can use each one of us, even um, our deaconess, Father God, in the fullest, O oh Lord. So allow us to offer our, uh, our lives to you. And this moment, Lord God, continue to speak to us. And we pray for Grant, who, is, uh, who will be facilitating, Lord, this uh, Paul's vision, the deacons. Uh, use him once again, Father God. Thank you for his life and for the life of his wife, Pressy. Uh, we thank you, Father God, for our attendance tonight. Salamat po na marami. Dalangin po namin ang lahat ng ito. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Okay. Amen. Okay. Um, again, as Pastor Sonny said, if you can mute, that helps. So we don't have to deal with that. I will start my presentation. Let me get my screen up. From current. All right, I think we're good to go. Dan, uh, welcome everyone. A good, good session for me. I hope you're learning a much from this uh, study on, we're using the book uh, written by a man named Alexander Strzok. Uh, the book will be distributed at the, uh, at the conference in Rizal. So I hope to look forward to seeing you guys all in person, but it's called Paul's Vision for the Deacons. Um, assisting the elders with the care of God's church. And uh, we started out the first week, we just simply looked at the introduction and asked the question, what do deacons do? And we got a variety of different answers. And uh, so we decided, well, we better start clarifying this. Maybe using the model from the Bible would be the most effective way to do that. So in our second uh, lesson, we learned what are the biblical starting points for deacons? Are they seen in the Bible? Uh, what what uh, what do we see there that we can relate and understand what it is, what the concept of a deacon is, where it came from, and how it relates to the elders, for instance. Then our third lesson was last week we looked at um, the overseers and deacons. We started looking at who the overseers are and who the deacons are and uh, how they fit together. So we started out by doing a pretty good intensive study on exactly what is the overseer or elder. And once we understand who the elders are in the church, it gives us a better, clearer view, clearer view of who the deacons are. And so it's a, a, important that we understand. That's why we spent so much time looking at elders so that we can uh, really understand where does a deacon fit within the scheme of the leadership in a church. And so uh, we, again, we looked over that and uh, we, uh, we found out, I think we came to the conclusion, as uh, Alexander Strzok has in his, his vision, that they are the assistants to the elders. So tonight, um, we're going to begin by looking at, still in this section on overseers and deacons, we're going to finish that up and then move on to the actual qualifications. But we're going to look at uh, this one there, session four. Um, so what does it mean to be the assisting assistants to the elders? And starting with assisting the elders with the care of God's church. I think it's important for us to understand that since the second century, if we look back in history, right up until today, many, many, many Bible scholars and church leaders have thought that the origin of the deacons is recorded in Acts 6. If you're familiar with Acts 6, it's where they chose the seven. It says in this early account of the church, we see that the 12 apostles 
<clears throat> it's a real early church, it's really early in the ministry of Christianity and the beginning of the church. But we see here that the apostles uh, decided they needed to appoint seven officials to care for the church's poor in Jerusalem. Let's look, let's look at this event in Acts chapter 6, verses 1 through 6. You can follow along with me here. I know the print's a little small, but I wanted to get it all on one page. So let me just read this to you. This is, this is the event that happened in Acts 6, where uh, they needed to appoint some helpers. So let's read it. Now in these days, when the disciples were increasing in number, so the church was growing, a complaint by the Hellenists arose against the Hebrews because their widows were being, re, uh, were being neglected in the daily distribution. And the twelve summoned the full number of the disciples and said, <clears throat> It is not right that we should give up preaching the word of God to serve tables. Therefore, brothers, pick out from among you seven men of good repute, full of the spirit and of wisdom, whom we will appoint to this duty. But we, the apostles, we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And what they said pleased the whole gathering. And they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit, and Philip, and Procurus, and Nicanor, and Timon, and Parmenas, and Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch. These they set before the apostles, and they prayed and laid their hands on them. So here we see um, this. Uh, uh, event that happened in Acts 6, 1 to 6. Um, we're going to look at that. These seven, who are they in Acts 6? And who are these assistants and how do they compare in 1 Timothy 3? They seem to be somewhat different, but yet yet the same. So let's, let's analyze this a little bit. Uh, this problem uh, of trying to connect these seven of Acts 6 with the later deacons that we see in, Act, in 1 Timothy 3, it's a problem. So neither Luke and Paul states such a connection. In fact, Luke assigns no title or designation such as money distribution or table servants to the seven. So we didn't, we don't see a name given to these seven. They're just chosen. The seven here in Acts 6 were specifically chosen by the congregation. That's important to note. And then they were appointed by the 12 for one task only. That was serving tables. That's this incident in Acts 6 that we're talking about specifically. That is, the seven were called on to provide charitable relief for the church's many impoverished members seen in Acts 6, 3. But as we see in 1 Timothy 3, the, the, the text we've been studying, Paul assigns a, he assigns a specific tasks for the diaconoi or assistance to the elders. So as the term assistance indicates, the deacons do what the elders assign them to do. So the elders are allowed to focus more on the speeding and, and uh, leading and preach, um, protecting God's flock. With that said, one obvious and biblically mandated task with which all church elders need constant help with is, as Acts 6 unforgettably illustrates, is this care for the church's poor and needy. So we have an ap apostolic precedent, it's called, um, it sets a precedent for the rest of the church history, this early model that we're looking at in Acts 6. We see here the apostles and the early Christians knew that taking care of the poor was not an optional ministry. It was a biblically mandated ministry. Taking care of the poor and the sick and the needy is, is a biblically mandated uh, ministry. We need to remember the Lord himself declared this idea when he said that the spirit itself, speaking of himself, has appointed me or has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. And that's seen in Luke 4, chapter, verse 18. Uh, the beginning of the church in the book of Acts, which we see here, tells us that the 12 apostles originally were responsible for administering the church's charitable aid and for the preaching and teaching ministry of the church. What they soon discovered was that the preaching of the word and the serving of tables became an overwhelming burden that greatly affected both their ministries. In a speech to the first church in clear language, the 12 apostles declared their ministry priorities. We see that in Acts chapter, uh, chapter 6, verse 2, and Acts chapter 6, verse 4. 
where it's where they're saying they're speaking to the church. It's not right that we should give up preaching the word of God to serve tables. That's verse two. And he also said, they also said, we will devote ourselves to prayer and the ministry of the word. This speech is 100% in agreement with the rest of the New Testament's teaching on, on preaching the word of God and teaching all believers to obey all that Christ commands. The preaching and teaching of the word is probably the top priority in the ministry of a church, edifying and building up the saints. God's word creates, it edifies, it protects, it strengthens and encourages us and guides the church. The priorities of prayer and the ministry of the word should be the priorities of all biblical elders. Deacons, on the other hand, can best assist the elders by helping them to keep this, that focus. So how do elders of the church feed, guide, and protect God's flock? It's by the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. So that's their ministry. Their ministry is to teach and preach the word of God. Uh, that verse I just read was is from uh, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13. So let's look at this charitable ministry that was going on in Jerusalem and Ephesus. Uh, so just as the church in Jerusalem had a policy in place to provide for its dependent widows, so too the church in Ephesus. It also had a widow's role, as they call it, in a method for distributing it and aid to its widows. We see this in 1 Timothy 5, verses 3 through 16. I'll just read this. I don't have a slide for this, but it says, honor widows. This is verses uh, five, 3 through 16 of 1 Timothy 5. It says, honor widow, widows who are truly widows. And here how, here's how he describes widows. But if a widow has children or grandchildren, let them first learn to show godliness to their own households and to make some return to their parents. For this is pleasing in the sight of God. She who is truly a widow, left all alone, has set her hope on God and continues in supplications and prayers night and day, verse 6. But she who is self-indulgent, is dead even while she lives. Command, command these things as well, so that they may be without reproach. But if anyone does not provide for his relatives, and especially for members of his household, he has denied the faith, and it's worse than a non-believer. He's worse than a non-believer. So let a wet widow be enrolled if she is not less than 60 years of age having been the wife of one husband and having a reputation for good works. If she has brought up children, has shown hospitality, has washed the feet of the saints, has cared for the afflicted and has devoted herself to every good work, but refuse to enroll younger widows for when their passions draw them away from Christ, they desire to marry and so incur condemnation for having abandoned their former faith. Besides that, they learn to be idlers, going about from house to house, and not only idlers, but also gossips and busybodies, saying what they should not. So I would have younger widows marry, bear children, manage their households, and give the adversary no occasion for, for slander. For some have already strayed after Satan, if any believing woman has relatives who are widows, let her care for them. Let the church not be burdened so that it may care for those who are truly widows. We see here Paul in 1 Timothy 5, 3, 16, giving instruction to the leaders of the church and handling the, the widows of the church and, and how we should address that issue. As we all know, providing for the poor is a particularly demanding, relentless, and a time-consuming job. So it's likely that the Ephesian elders, just like the 12 apostles in Jerusalem, needed administrative assistance with the care of the church's widows and other needs of the people. So they needed to concentrate more effectively on leading and teaching the church. So you're seeing all of a sudden there becomes this burden that's been laid upon these elders and they need to start uh, delegating authority 
and, and setting up a, a system to help in this ministry. This is where the deacons come in. They are the assistants to the er, uh, elders. So what do we, how do we see this ministry working out in the post-apostolic era? In the next three centuries, since the early church and the apostles were, were leading the church, we can see that deacons became closely associated with, with the church's charitable relief work. In fact, by the end of the second century and the beginning of the third, we can see that the deacons have become the formal assistants of the bishop or the overseer or the minister of the church. We can also see that even in today's church, deacons in every branch of Christianity are usually associated in some way or other with the care of the needy. This long standing tradition has its roots in the historical practices of the earliest Christians and their local churches. So this comes out of the, the first churches that were developed in, in Christianity. But also we notice, uh, we have to understand that deacons are more than just table servers. We don't want to just label them as table servers as they did in Acts chapter or Acts 6. He said, although Paul would have whole, wholeheartedly agreed with what the apostles had done in Acts 6, his solution for relieving overburdened elders goes far, far beyond that. By acknowledging the officials of 1 Timothy 3, verses 8 through 13, as the assistants and not table servants, Paul allows them to do other demanding tasks that would help assist the elders in the care of God's church. We see that in 1 Timothy 3, 5. So what are some of these tasks determined by the elders? Well, the specific tasks of deacons need to be determined, determined by the elders according to the church's particular needs. Every church is going to be different. So we have to be uh, allow the elders to decide how they're going to distribute those needs and how they're going to uh, get the help they need for that. The size and the giftedness of the, the members. Some of the things in the elders' needs uh, continues continued. Sorry, let me read that again. Some of the things the elders need continuous help with are things like, for instance, official hospi hospital visits and phone calls, uh, checking on absentees, managing charitable gifts, distributing aid to the needy, assisting families in distress, visiting and protecting, or pro, yeah, visiting and protecting the elderly in the shut-ins, helping with finances, overseeing church property, and carrying out certain administrative ta tasks, etc. So we can see their tasks are they're many and varied. So it's not just serving tables. You need to understand that. No another thing we need to understand and make clear is that it, elders came first and then deacons followed. We see elders being uh, the official leaders in the early, early church. And deacons didn't come into the equation until later on in the history of the church. So as the church grew, the demands grew. Uh, we see in 1 Timothy, again, Paul lays out this qualifications for the overseeing elders in the churches on the island of Crete. But we notice that he doesn't even mention deacons in, the, in that text. A possible reason for not mentioning them is simply that the deacons were not, were not yet needed because the churches were smaller and newly organized. The point here is that elders had to be established first before deacons were introduced. It only makes sense that in small congregations, the, elder, the elders may be able to fulfill all of their shepherding responsibilities themselves without a need for deacons. This can be determined by each church's personal circumstances. So what does a successful deacon's ministry look like? Well, a successful deacon's ministry is largely dependent on the effective supervision of the elders. They need the elders to help supervise. It's important that the elders use their God-given creative thinking powers and their organizational skills to oversee the ministry of the deacons. If not, what's going to happen, the deacons will soon lose their vision and they'll become frustrated with the elders. You don't want to see that. Remember, not everyone who leads a church ministry is necessarily an assistant of the elder or a deacon. We can all serve. And that's our next point. All, everyone in the church are servants of the church. It's just the fact is that some are 
what we would label as assistants of the elders or deacons. So uh, the point here is simply uh, in our definition, we see that deacons work directly, that the actual official deacons, they work directly at helping the elders, relieving them of some of their basic administrative and pastoral tasks. They are, as the title states, assistants to the elders. We also see that they are required to meet specific elder-like qualifications. So there is a distinction here. Also, they need to be publicly examined by the church and its leaders as to those qualifications. So it's important for us to understand that there's a distinct difference between assistance to the elders and all those other church leaders who serve the church body. Not everyone who leads a church ministry is necessarily an assistant of the elders or a deacon. So regardless of which view of the role of deacons a con congregation might hold, a church has to make a distinction between all those who serve the church and those who serve in the church as official qualified diaconoi or deacons. So it's an every member ministry. This is an important concept to grasp. When we consider the work of the deacons, we can't forget that the entire congregation is to be a living, functioning body, remembering that each member is gifted by God and responsible for the life and the work of the church. Everybody should be involved. The work of the ministry is the work of all the saints. Ephesians 4.12 tells us this. So in the body of Christ, the church, every individual member of the body is responsible to work together with the other members to build up the body of Christ. We have, as my pastor back home always says, we have been saved to serve. So everyone who knows Christ is a servant or diakonos. That's the broad definition of the word diakonos, a servant. We see that in uh, John 12, 26. And we're all called to serve one another, 1 Peter 4, 10. The scriptures are clear when it says about the body of Christ that when each part is working properly, it makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. So we're all members. We're all parts of this ministry. It's not, you know, all we're doing is setting aside the deacons to be a, a, a specific authoritative office in the church that helps and assists the elders to be able to allow the elders to do their work, which is the ministry of preaching and proclaiming and teaching the message of the gospel. It frees them up. So the, the effective ministry of the deacons is to do those jobs, which, and always to be aware of, what can I do to help my, my elders do what they've been called to do, which is to teach and preach the word. There's so many things we can be involved in. We see also the deacons work as a, they're a deliberative body. They're, they work together as a body, but they also work as individuals. So in order to deal with certain assignments, let's say the distribution of funds or counting money, you need more than one. Um, never, never have someone counting the money in the church by themselves. They should always have a mutual counter with them. Somebody who holds them accountable, when they count the money, they're both in agreement. Back home, what we do is we have two who count the money after every service. They put that in an envelope, and then they give that to us another person who is the treasurer or the one who will take it to the bank. So you've got three different uh, accountability partners involved. It not only protects the individuals who are counting, but it protects the church and the body as well. Um, let me read this. It says, in order to deal with certain assignments, such as the distribution of funds, as I just said, it's important that the deacons meet together as a deliberative body regularly, have a consistory or a deacons, a group of deacons. They meet on their own or together sometimes with the elders. There needs to be mutual accountability in regards to these issues, not only to protect, like I said, the individual deacons, but as the church as well. Other assignments like hospital visits or important phone calls or event arrangements, they all can be delegated to an individual deacon based on needs and circumstances. Again, there is a great deal of flexibility in how deacons assist these elders. Now, when you get two uh, authoritative groups together, 
you're always going to end up with the possibility of conflict between those in, those entities. And we'll talk about that now. Um, I've seen this happen in the church. We, we need to understand our natures. Um, we are uh, natures that we, we tend to be filled with pride and we can conflict with each other. But there are, are uh, scriptural arguments against this that help us understand how we should act in regards to these things. Um, because the elders and deacons do work closely together and because they share overlapping responsibilities so often, it's inevitable and probably common that some decisions and situations are going to lead to conflict between the, the parties. Thankfully, scripture gives us some proven principles for achieving the harmonious working relationships in these difficult situations. First of all, elders need to be clothed with humility and diligent in their work. For elders, this Christ-like leadership style requires humility, servanthood, gentleness, self-sacrificing love. By scripture, we see that shepherd elders are forbidden to use their God-given authority to act as rulers over those placed in their pastoral care. Uh, 1 Peter 5, 3 says, not domineering over those in your charge. Furthermore, the qualifications for elders, they require that we have a gentle spirit, that we're not violent, quarrelsome, or arrogant, or quick-tempered. So by eliminating these, when you're doing the qualifications of an elder, you're going to have elders who fall into these, these categories. So uh, they will be clothed with humility. We pray that would be the case. In 1 Peter 5.5, 5, Peter exhorts both of the groups to act with humility toward one another. In other words, the deacons and the elders. If they are to please God and work together in harmony. 1 Peter 5.5 5 reads like this, uh, speaking to, to, to the deacons. Be subject to the elders. So you're submissive to the elders. Clothe yourselves, all of you, with humility toward one another. For God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. The bottom line here is that elders need to be examples of wise leadership, hard work, and effective delegate, delegation. They need to be good shepherds of God's sheep, just like their Lord Jesus Christ. But also, not only elders should be clothed with humility, but, but the deacons are also clothed with you, same, same qualifications, clothed with humility and diligent in their work. Just as the elders, the deacon's status as assistance to the elders also need to be expressed as a humble, loving servant to others. They also need to demonstrate the fruit of the spirit, which we see in Galatians 5, verses 22 to 23. And the Christ-like attitudes described in Philippians 2, 3 to 5. If they are to enjoy this harmonious relationship with the elders and others with whom they work. So it's critically important for deacons to guard against a critical spirit toward their leaders and against thinking that they have more authority than is rightfully theirs. It's important. The deacons are not an independent church board of directors overseeing the eldership. Just, just like everyone else in the church, the deacon needs to obey and submit to their leaders. That comes from Hebrews 13, 17. They must esteem them very highly in love because of their work and to be at peace with all their elders. First Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 12 to 13. So in closing then, uh, the deacons assist the elders in their work. They need to possess certain character qualifications that are very similar, but not exactly the same as those of elders. In the next session, we will look, we'll begin to look at some of these qualifications required of the deacons. So in this session, some key points that we, we should remember and we can bring forward. Uh, number one, again, this appointment of the table serving officials by the 12 apostles provided Paul and the first churches he established, they set a precedent, an apost apostolic precedent for what was to come, for the need and the creation of official, an official position of assistance to the elders in the church. It wasn't necessarily established at this time, but it set the precedent. It set the example for what was to come. 
And we see that then in 1 Timothy chapter 3. So although this practical care of the church is poor, sick, and needy would be a core responsibility of the deacons, there would be other demanding tasks besides that that requires the special help of the elders' qualified assistance. Again, they need, their, need your help, and that's what you're there for. So having formal assistance to help the elders provides better pastoral care for the congregation. It protects these elders from overwork, and it frees them up to concentrate more effectively on their ministries, which are prayer and the preaching of the word of God, Acts 6, chapter, or verse 2 and 4. Number four, <clears throat> many questions about deacons are not answered in scripture. We got to be aware of that. So the elders have a great deal of flexibility in their direction of the deacons. Shepherding elders need to be creative and skilled to be able to effectively make the most of the ministry of the deacon. So you can see the responsibility, responsibility for the leadership is in the elders. And the deacons serve under the elders who are overseers of all the church. So it's important to understand that there's two distinctive official roles, but elders, deacons are always under the elders' submission. They're always under the elders' control. Something we should consider it helps us from getting into any, any, any conflicts. And then lastly, elders and deacons, de I'm sorry, elders and deacons who obey the scriptural principles for handling conflict can work together in humble harmony. If you follow the scriptural principles, you will be able to get along with each other. And it's part and partial. Um, our natures are going to get in the way of us all the time. So Whenever we got into any kind of little conflicts back in my church, we always stopped our meetings. We stopped them instantly. And we said, let's pray. And it's always a good principle to enact is, is always run to scripture or always run to God when we're struggling with these things. Because we're still flawed individuals. So rather than going into discussion tonight, I thought it might be, let's see if we have time. I'm going to try and get three sessions in tonight. Um, we'll see how the time goes. We got uh, 45 minutes in, so I think we might be able to do it. So we're going to go right now. We're going to go right into the next section. We're actually opening up a new uh, part to our, our discussion. It's part three in your outline, if you've been following along on the outline. It's called, um, we're going to look at the deacon's qualifications and their examination and their rewards in First Timothy verses uh, 8 through 13. So beginning then, just uh, want, want to share something here with you. Uh, Jerome, who was the father of the Latin translation of the Bible, he rebuked the churches of his day in A.D. 394 because they were showing more interest in the appearance of their church buildings than in the proper selection of their church leaders. He understood how important the leadership in the church is. So in a letter to Nepotian, who was a young elder of the church, he writes this. And I think it's really good. Oops. Am I in the right one here? Deacon's qualification. Oh, I'm just, uh, let's read this. This is the text that's related again. We've already read this, but let's read through it really quick and then I'll move forward. Deacons, likewise, this is our verse text, uh, text that we've been reading. Um, and it just happens to fall after the, uh, the part three here. So deacons, again, likewise, must be dignified not double-tongued, we're talking about deacons specifically here, not addicted to much wine, not greedy for dishonest gain. They must hold the mystery of faith with a clear conscience and let them also be tested first. Then let them serve as deacons if they prove themselves blameless. Their wives, likewise, must be dignified, not slanderers, but sober-minded, faithful in all things. Let deacons each be the husband of one wife, managing their children and their own households well. For those who serve well as deacons gain a good standing for themselves and also great confidence in the faith that is in Christ Jesus. That's the text we're going to be read, uh, following through on this next section uh, called the Deacons Qualifications Examination and Rewards. So in session five now, um, opening up, we're going to start and begin to look at these deacons qualifications. Um, again, I'll start this off. Uh, Jerome, again, the father of the Latin translation of the Bible. He rebuked the churches of his day in A.D. 394, so 394 uh, A.D., 
because they were showing more interest in the appearance of their church buildings than in the pro, uh, proper selection of their leaders. So again, in a letter to Nepotian, a young elder of the church, he writes this. He says, many build churches nowadays. Their are walls and pillars of glowing marble. Their ceilings are glittering with gold. Their altars studded with jewels. Yet, to the choice of Christ's ministers, no heed is paid. So he was calling out the early church and admonishing them for putting more attention in the building than in the leadership of the church, which is such an important thing to, to be concerned about. It's, it's sad to say, but these same, the same attitude toward the biblical qualifications for elders and deacons exists in our churches today. We've lost really a, a biblical grip on the model and the responsibility of our leadership. Yet we see scriptures clear that a big concern of God's is not with his buildings or programs, but with the moral and spiritual character of the leaders of his people. This is the reason why the church offices of elder and deacon need to be filled with only those who qualify according to God's standards as revealed in scripture. So let's begin to look at some of these qualifications one by one. Um, we see here deacons must be. Uh, we're going to list the qualifications. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 8 and 9, which I read, uh, or in specifically in eight and nine, he laid, Paul lays out the required standards for all his, for deacons. We can see here that the qualification de of deacons are not any less important than those for an elder. Here are some of those qual here are those qualifications Paul lists deacons. First of all, they need to be dignified, same as an elder, worthy of respect. That's what that means. They need not they can't be double tongued. We'll talk about these as we go. Next one is not addicted to much wine. The next qualification, not greedy for dishonest gain. A lot of negatives here. Uh, holding the mystery of the faith with a clear conscience. That's the last one. So there's a public witness of the gospel that's incurred here. And we need to understand that. Uh, underscoring all of these qualifications for elders and deacons is Paul's passionate, passionate concern for the public testimony of the local church. How is the world seeing the church and proclaiming the truths of the gospel before? Remember, we're, 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 we're setting an example before an unbelieving, watching world. They're watching us. They're keeping an eye on us. So having strong leadership in a church tells the world that you're serious about what you're doing here. Paul insisted that the church elders and the deacons would be above reproach or simply saying morally and spiritually sound. So we can see then that these qualifications that Paul lists are meant to protect the local church from unfit elders and deacons who could potentially disgrace the believing community. We don't want that. So we start with number one, dignified. What does that entail when doing the Lord's work? leader must have strong moral character and a good public reputation, which are essential to the responsibility of leading God's people. The word for dignified in the Greek is the word semnos. It describes a person whose attitudes and conduct win the admiration of others. It refers to a respectable, a well thought of person. The New International Version translated translates it this way, saying one who is worthy of respect. Being highly visible officials in the church, deacons are expected to be the role models of Christian character and living. In other words, deacons must be worthy of respect. So immediate, immediately following Paul's requirement for public respectability, he points out three common vices that we have to deal with. Untruthful speech, abuse of alcohol, and financial greed. When church leaders lie or embezzle or are addicted to other substances, they bring public scrutiny upon the Lord Jesus Christ and his church. They ignore God's all-important call to his people to be holy as he is holy. We see this when Peter is addressing this specifically in 1 Peter uh, chapter 1, verses 14 to 16. I'll read that. 
he's telling, he's calling them out. He says, as, a, as obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance. But as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct, conduct. Since it's written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. Second qualification, not double tongue. What exactly does this mean? I think we all have a clue, uh, but let's, let's uh, detail it here a little more. This idea then of being double tongue, what does it mean? Or double worded, the, the lagos is the uh, Greek word, expresses the idea of saying one thing to one person and saying something completely different to someone else. Back home, we call this two-faced, someone who's two-faced. This duplicity of speech ruins trust and undermines a leader's credibility. In, in contrast, then, truthful speech is the foundation of trust and promotes good working relationships among colleagues. Less than honest speech is damaging to relationships. We've all seen this. It's like Ecclesiastics 10.1 puts it. Dead flies make the perfumer's ointment give off a stench. So a little folly outweighs wisdom and honor. This first prohibition is most necessary because deacons are often placed between the elders and the people. I've been involved in that. Um, they don't want to talk to the elders. They want to go to the deacons. What will happen is uh, uh, people are under the pressure of soft to tell little white lies. They're going to you know, come up with stories. So it's not wise to play loose with the truth. Truth is truth. We need to understand that. Scripture charges all of us as believers in all cultures, all cultures, in all times, to renounce falsehood. We are members of one another. Ephesians 4.25 reminds us of this. It says, therefore, having put away falsehoods, having put away lies, let each one of you speak the truth. Wow, truth is so deceptive nowadays. Let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor, for we are members of one, one of another. We know the importance of truth. The world is slipping in this area. We don't know what truth is anymore. It's impossible to discern truth. But inside the church, within the church, we cannot act this way. We have to be much, much more protective of that. In the body of Christ, putting away falsehood and speaking the truth honestly to one another is the Christian standard of speech even if it is sometimes uncomfortable and countercultural, as I just said. The words we speak have serious consequences, and Jesus wanted us, warned us that every careless word we speak will someday be judged by God, Matthew 12, 36 and 37. So if a deacon's words cannot be trusted, he's not worthy of respect and therefore is not fit to be an assistant to the elders or a deacon for the care of God's church. He is therefore disqualified. The next category, next uh, uh, qualification is, it's a negative qualification. He cannot be addicted to much wine. This next prohibition is defined this way. It is not an absolute ban on drink, mind you, but more a, prohib a prohibition against the excessive use of wine. And we might add any other addictive sub substances like drugs that might damage a person's reputation or service for God. This is in keeping with the Bible's many warnings against the potential dangers of wine and st strong drink. For example, in Proverbs 20, verse 1, it says, Wine is a mocker, strong drink a brawler, and whoever is led astray by it is not wise. Also in Proverbs 23, verses 29 to 30, we see who has woe, who has sorrow, who has strife, who has complaining, who has wounds without cause, who has redness of eyes, <laughs> who does that describe? Those who tarry long over wine. We all know the symptoms. Addiction to alcohol or drugs 
It, re it reveals a lack of spirit-controlled living. A Christian with an addiction problem is controlled by the flesh, not by the Holy Spirit. Galatians 5, 16 through 24 tells us this. Any addiction impairs one's judgment in connection to reality. I know this for a fact. I was, before I was a Christian, of course, I was struggled in these areas. And it really, you, you end up in a whole completely different reality. So um, I, I can attest to this thing. So alcohol abuse interferes with the believer's growth, especially in the believer. Alcohol abuse interferes with the believer's growth in Christ likeness and with the work of the Holy Spirit in a believer's life. That is why scripture says also in Ephesians 5, 18, do not get drunk with wine for that is the botchery, but be filled with the spirit. I always like this when I, after I quit drinking, I go, yeah, I can be drunk on the spirit rather than drunk on wine. And it's, it's, it's kind of a, a crass way of saying, but that's what we're saying here. You don't need wine or alcohol or any drugs. To, to be filled, to fill you, but you just need to be filled by the Holy Spirit. That's what we're saying here. The next qualification is another negative qualification. It says not, not greedy for dishonest gain. The Bible repeatedly warns against the sin of greed and the love of money as a root of all kinds of evil. You see that in 610. Remember, it's not money itself that's evil. It's the love of money. It says right here, for the love of money is a root a root of all kinds of evils. It is through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pangs. Remember, it's not money that is evil. Like I said, it's the love of money that is evil. Greed, Luke, for example, exposes the heart of the conditions of many of the religious officials our Lord encountered, accusing them of being lovers of money, Luke 16, 14. Jesus also accused the Pharisees, if you remember, of stealing from widows' houses, Luke 20, 47. And of course, uh, even the prophet Jeremiah bemoaned this fact that in Jeremiah 6, 13, he was talking to the, the leaders of, the, uh, of the, the priests, the prophets and priests. He says, from the least to the greatest of them, everyone is greedy for unjust gain. And from prophet to priest, everyone deals falsely. What an accusation. Well, thankfully, scripture also includes examples of honorable leaders. In his farewell message to the nation of Israel, the godly priest and judge Samuel testified that he did not abuse his position. He's talking about himself. He's, he's, he's standing up for his own accountability. He, he did not abuse his position in order to, to steal from the people. You see it when he says in, in 1 Samuel 12, 2 through 4, Samuel speaking here, he says, I have walked before you from my youth until this day. Here I am. Testify against me before the Lord and before his anointed. Whose ox have I taken? Or whose donkey have I taken? Or whom, I, whom have I defrauded? Whom have I oppressed? Or from whose hand have I taken a bribe to blind my eyes with it? Testify against me and I will restore it to you. So in other words, if, you, if I've taken anything from you, just let me know. I'll, I'll give it back. They said to him, you have not defrauded us or oppressed us or taken anything from any man's hand. That's the way you want to end up for uh, at the end of your life as a testimony and a witness to your uh, credibility. Just like Samuel. We see a prohibition for leaders. Uh, we we want to be careful here. God doesn't want any of his servants to be greedy-minded pilferers, you know, taking of money. God's standard is that the church elders and deacons be concerned with giving, giving rather than getting. It's better to give than to receive. Money, as Paul reminded his Ephesian elders in Acts 20, verses 33 to 35, he told them, he says, I coveted no one's silver or gold or apparel. You yourselves know that these hands ministered to my necessities and to those who were with me. In all things, I have shown you that by working hard in this way, we must help the weak. And remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how he himself said, it's more blessed to give than to receive. So as assistance to the elders, deacons often have access to church donations. 
and therefore cannot be greedy for dishonest gain. Simply put, then, a deacon cannot be greedy. It's a powerful temptation. Uh, we see it happening all through the church. For some, money can be a more powerful temptation than either sex or alcohol. Remember the example of Judas Iscariot. Judas, remember, acted as, as if he cared about the poor, but the apostle John explains his true motive in John 12, verse 6. He, referring to Judas, said this, not because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief and having charge of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put into it. Oops. Today we hear way too often our, of high profile church officials who are caught embezzling church money. In most of these cases, church officials don't steal actual cash. Instead, they misdirect church funds to their own so-called ministry expenses, quote unquote. Meals, travel, vacation, sports activities, and car and home repairs. This is leasing of the flock and it's considered shameful. This is why having a plurality of deacons and elders it helps to, to provide this built-in accountability, mutual accountability in, this in the administration of the church's finances. There always must be more than one person collecting the distribution of church funds. Paul sets for us still another great example of this in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verses 20 to 21, when he says, we take this course so that no one should blame us about this generous gift that is being administered by us. For we aim at what is honorable, not only in the Lord's sight, but also in the sight of man. So that defines the not being greedy. Next one is more positive, holding the mystery of the faith with a clear conscience. A deacon must know the beliefs of the Christian faith. He must possess the faith, of course. He has to hold firmly to the faith and live life constantly with the mystery of the faith. Paul worked hard to help all of us believers know in Colossians 2, uh, verses 2 to 3, God's mystery. He wanted us all to know God's mystery, which is Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. What is this mystery of faith? The mystery of faith is the answer can be, this answer can be found in the object of the mystery, which is the faith. It's the mystery of the faith, which here refers to simply the entire fixed body of Christian beliefs. The qualification for deacons is, this qualification for deacons is similar to the requirement for elders to hold firm to the trustworthy word as taught by the apostles found in Titus 1.9. Deacons as well as elders must be true to the faith is what this says. We need to be living with a clear conscience. What does that mean? Living with a clear conscience. God has given everyone a capacity to judge each other yourself. A conscience or an inner voice that speaks to us about what we believe to be right or wrong. The conscience is man's in inner awareness of the morality of his own actions. Our consciences speak to us constantly. Every time a Christian goes against his or her own conscience, they weaken its convicting power, and it makes it easier to commit sin. We need to be continually educating our consciences, teaching them, so that they agree with that truth of God's word and not the st standards of secular society. So what are you spending more time in? Are you spending more time in reading the word of God and listening to uh, messages? the reading uh, uh, commentaries, or are you spending more time on Netflix and uh, uh, being in the world, listening to uh, secular music? You have to be careful with your conscience. Your conscience is a powerful, powerful tool. The mystery of the faith then is simply not just an abstract philosophy that it's is disconnected from our daily moral behavior and attitudes. No, this knowledge of the truth Paul taught us in Titus accords with godliness it's aligned with godliness so we can see then that to qualify for the office of deacon our candidate must hold tightly to the faith we need to be faithful 
And you need to live a lifestyle that's consistent with the doctrines of that. Again, we see that deacons are not required. They're not required to teach. I, I want to emphasize that. They're not required to teach. Doesn't mean they can't teach. We can see in Paul's instruction to Timothy, he does not include directions about teaching the mystery of the faith. Instead, Paul insists that a deacon uphold the faith with a good conscience. I think it's important for us to note that the, the, the fact that deacons do not have to be able to teach doesn't imply that they can't teach. We have to understand, teaching is simply not related to their office. We can see that in small church and churches, often both elders and deacons have to take on many tasks that are not specifically related to the core responsibilities of their office. They may, as the saying goes, have to wear several different hats. The necessity of examination. Finally then, in, as we look in this session, we look at the need of examination. How can we know if a deacon candidate believes and be behaves consistently with his faith and is worthy of respect? Or if, in fact, he lacks integrity in his speech or is a secret alcohol or a greedy pilferer? The answer to these questions are found by instituting and observing this next qualification we're going to look at, which is examination. It says he must be examined, as we see instructed in 1 Timothy 3.10. It says, and let them also be tested first, then let them serve as deacons of they, so they can prove themselves blameless. We'll look at this one more detail in our next session. So with some key points to remember from this session, I hope you're following along. Number one, um, to protect the credibility of the gospel and the reputation of the church from outside public ridicule, the churches, elders and deacons have to be above reproach both not only within the church, but in the public community, out in the world. They need to be morally and spiritually above reproach. Number two, we saw that a deacon must be a person worthy of respect, one whose attitude and behavior have, earn, have earned the respect of others. Um, we don't command respect, we earn respect. One of the things we have to learn as leaders, you don't demand somebody to respect you. You don't command a person, you must respect you. No, you earn that respect. And so it's something we have to re remember. And that comes through humility and perseverance and, and living according to the word of God. Number three, we saw that a deacon must demonstrate integrity of speech and be self-controlled in the use of alcohol, not double-tongued and, and not addicted to wine or alcohol or, alcohol or drugs. Um, which dull the mind, which, which, which uh, don't let you think clearly. And then not talking out of two sides of your mouth. You've got to be careful about these things. Number four, then we also saw that a deacon must demonstrate financial integrity. Uh, such a temptation we have when we cannot be naive about these financial temptations, church leaders face, every one of us. Stealing church donations or misappropriating church funds is a widespread problem problem but it can be solved by mutual by accountability by holding each other accountable by having at least two counters maybe even three and having separate uh, uh, counters from from the people who deposit the money these things protect not only the individual but the uh, corporate church as well then lastly we look that deacon must hold firmly to the divine truths of christian doctrine not necessarily have to teach christian doctrine but he needs to understand it or if she needs to understand this doctrine and the model that the gospel sets for a lifestyle consistent with the beliefs of their Christian faith. So that's number two lesson, and we're at 7.15. I think we can get this last one in too, and then, then we can open up for some discussion. But again, uh, write notes and take notes. And if you have questions and we don't get them answered tonight, Please, please, please bring them to next week. I think we'll have extra time next week. I wanted to get in this last one on examination so that uh, we're not carrying a big, big burden for us into the last session before we meet in resolve. So let us move on then, if, we, if you'll allow me um, to move on to the next section, which is uh, examination and kind of finishes up. 
And then the last one is, uh, well, we have uh, managing the body or managing your family and then rewards. So let me uh, go into this examination. Um, if you'll allow me, like I said, I'd like to begin this session by sharing a story from Alexander Strzok's book. This story directly reflects literally my first encounter with the church leadership in my first church right after I became a, a Christian. I came back to my, my church I grew up with, and I remember being in this leadership meeting, and it was, as he describes it here, I'm going to read uh, his quotes from the book. As he describes it, it's exactly what I went through. So let me read this. He, he writes a story. He says, at this church called Valley View Church, the deacons are the church's business community. Their primary duty is to make financial and facility decisions. Once a year, the pastor invites all members of the church to meet after a Sunday evening service to choose new deacons. As everyone gathers around a whiteboard, the chairman of the deacon board asks for nominations. Several names are suggested and written on the whiteboard. The members who attend, and only a few really more normally do, then vote for two new deacons to replace the two whose three-year terms have expired. After the votes are counted, the new elected deacons are installed, and the pastor closes the meeting in prayer. The entire process takes less than an hour. Still quoting from the book, he goes on to say, he says, except for that closing prayer, the pastor and members engaged in no prayer about the choices being made, no serious consideration of the biblical qualification for deacons, and no conscientious effort to examine whether each candidate's moral character, his family life, and lifestyle were consistent with what his faith. Such thoughtless procedures displayed disregard for or possible ignorance of the clear instructions and authority of scripture and seriously weaken our church. Like I said, uh, close quote, like I said, this is a story right out of my life. I, I experienced this in my, the first church that I joined. So let's begin, let's talk about the statement must be examined. So we can't just pick and choose. <laughs> there is a process that goes through uh, qualifications. There's, there's an examination and we're gonna look at this examination now. So prospective deacons, it says, in, in one of the qualifications, must be examined. In our last session, we explored 1 Timothy 3, verses 8 and 9, where Paul lays out these five qualifications for deacons. Again, let's refresh our memory. First of all, a deacon must be dignified, worthy of respect. Secondly, not double tongued. Third, not addicted to much wine. Fourth, not greedy for dishonest gain. And fifth, holding the mystery of faith with a clear conscience. Immediately following those qualifications, Paul establishes the requirements for examination. We see this in uh, 1 Timothy verse 10 of 3. He says, and let them also be tested first. Then let them serve as deacons if they prove themselves blameless. So we can see here that entering into this office of deacon, it has to be preceded by an examination and approval by the church and its leaders, not just the leaders, but by the whole church. Furthermore, this examination of potential deacon's qualification must be taken as seriously as that of an elder. Elders also must be, be examined. We see this in 1 Timothy chapter 5, verses 22 to 25. This examination takes time and effort, just like it does with an elder. So let's break down the points made in our verse, verse 1 of 1 Timothy 3, or verse 10 of 1 Timothy 3. Let's look at first, and also, verse 10 begins, and let them, deacons, also be tested first. This tells us that a deacon candidate, just like an elder candidate, needs to be tested first before being brought into the office of deacon. Since there are biblical qualifications required of the deacons, by reason, simple reason, there should also be some sort of process for evaluating or testing a candidate to see if they hold to those qualifications. He must be tested first. 
it says to make a critical examination of something. Oh, I'm sorry, the Greek, uh, the Greek verb that's translated tested is dokamazo. It literally means this, to make a critical examination of something, to determine genuineness, to put to the test or to examine. So the ver this verb tested is an imperative verb, which means that testing of a candidate's not optional. The whole process of testing under our consideration is mandatory. It's not an option, it's required. Then we have the first then statement. It's important for us not to overlook, <laughs> overlook this sequence of words, tested first and then they can serve. So you need to be tested first and then they can be served. The proper sequence for becoming a deacon needs to be followed. The examination of candidates must come first. If the outcome of that deacon candidate's initial examination is positive, then and only then is the candidate eligible to serve as an assistant to the elders. So there's a, 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 a a program to follow. There's, there's a procedure that must be followed. Then again, it's proving or proven themselves. Have they proved themselves blameless? Lastly, we see in this verse the word blameless. It says, then let them serve as deacons if they prove themselves what? Blameless. Being examined and shown to be blameless does not necessarily imply that the deacon candidate is free of faults. We all know, we know we are, we're all sinners. We all fall short of God's glory. Being proved blameless or above reproach specifically relates to the qualification for the office. So a deacon who is found blameless in this regard is worthy of respect. He's truthful in speech. He's self-controlled in the use of wine, sound in doctrine and light. So he's Falling into all these, if he's blameless, he falls into all these uh, qualifications. A, a faithful husband, a good father, a competent household manager. So all of the qualifications listed in verses 8 and 9 of such people, the psalmist says in Psalm 119.1, blessed are those whose way is blameless. So what is the deacon's significance? I think it's important for us to understand the significant role of deacons in our churches. This is an awesome responsibility, just as it is for an elder. We cannot take the role of being a deacon lightly. It's, an, it's a, a serious responsibility. Paul's rulings on the deacon's moral and spiritual qualities demonstrates that he considered them to be highly significant uh, uh, officials in the church. He considered this body to be an a highly significant organization. So we see that it is just as important for deacons to be examined regarding these qualifications as it is for the elders. Therefore, these requirements demonstrate the significance of deacons in the church and to its elders. Because the deacon's role is so significant, an unfit deacon can cause a lot of problems in the church. They can hurt innocent people. They can bring disgrace to the public reputation of the church. And they can be a burden to the elders rather than a help. So then, when what is the process for examining potential deacons? So examining a deacon for office, how do we go about that? Paul doesn't provide us with a manual for examining a deacon candidate. The details and methods for selecting, examining, approving, and installing church offices are left up to this local church and its leaders. The size of a church and their cultural context, that's important, are just some of the factors in determining the specifics. Scripture only tells us three things. Number one, the qualifications for deacons. Number two, the necessity for examination by others. And number three is the warning, not, is the warning to avoid hurried appointments to the office. We need to make this a timely thing, something that uh, we watch over a period of time. You just don't appoint somebody who comes off the street and seems to be a good Christian or a good believer or runs a business. You just don't appoint somebody a deacon. They need to be tested. They need to be examined. They need to fit the, the qualifications of the church. So clear just in, in 
First Timothy verses, uh, chapter three, verses eight through twelve, and a five, in chapter five, verse twenty-two. In, in the first process here, we see that Timothy was called on to oversee this process of examination, but it's not necessary to have uh, somebody from the outside to oversee this process. It just happened to be work out well. Uh, when they were uh, in Ephesus. It says, so who is to conduct such an examination? Well, we see that in the troubled church in Ephesus, Timothy who was Paul's official. He was only temporary and his delegate was most like, he most likely oversaw this process of examining and approving a deacon or elder for the office in Ephesus. But Timothy could not have properly evaluated a prospective deacon without that help of the advice of those who knew the candidate. Furthermore, he would have shown due respect for the elders in the selection of their assistants. Most likely, Timothy then would have worked very closely with the elders and the congregation, just assisting them in this examination process. Again, remember these churches were new. This, this stuff had just began to be put into place. We now understand it. We have a biblical model after the course and the period of time of the church. So elders are to oversee. The, the real overseers in this process are your elders. They are to oversee the process of this examination. When it came for Timothy to leave, the elders would have taken over this, the, the lead in appointing these new deacons in cooperation, of course, with the congregation's help. They don't do it alone. They ask for the congregation's help. In reality, then, as congregational leaders, the elders should oversee this process of decision making and problem solving by making recommendations of elders or deacons and making sure that what is done is done in love, 1 Corinthians 16, 14, and is done in an orderly manner, as it's told to us in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 40, and also according to the sound principles of corporate decision making. Again, we need it, it needs to be a public examination, not done in private. This public examination and the approval of elders and deacons is one of the most important decisions a congregation and its leaders can make in the life of their church. Let me read that again. This public examination and the approval of elders and deacons is one of the most important decisions a congregation and its leaders can make in the life of their church. The, congr I'm sorry, the congregation cannot sit idly by in this examination of its officers. They need to take an active role in this decision-making process. Every member needs to be involved in decisions that affect the whole church. The office of a deacon, just like the office of an elder, is a public office in the church. And the qualification for deacons are written in scripture for the entire church family to know and enforce. So this examination of a prospective deacon, is supposed to be a public matter, not a private decision made by a few people. It's important for us to note that Paul, in all his letters to the churches, he always addressed the entire congregation, which included not only its leaders, but all the members as well. It's because of this close shared relationship between the congregation and its elders that the goal should always be to speak and act as a united family of brothers and sisters. You need to develop that unity in the body. So procedures and objections. Uh, procedures are, are kind of a, uh, not again written in stone. Um, there's a variety of procedures that can be effective when it comes to examining a potential deacon's qualifications for office. Uh, regardless of those procedures, members of the congregation need to be allowed the opportunity to freely express their questions, their doubts, or to approve of a candidate for the office of deacon. If object objections do arise, the elders need to quickly investigate any objections or accusations that are voiced against the candidate's character in order to determine if the person making this decision is correct. It's a very important thing to maintain the harmony and the integrity of the church. Members must limit their objections to those that are scripturally based. That's important. 
members must limit their objections to those that are scripturally based. For example, a, a biblical example would be uh, the candidate abuses alcohol, not I'm voting with my friends or I just don't like this guy or girl. The bottom line here is that in God's written word, not someone's personal preferences or prejudices that must be must govern God's household. I'm, let me read that again. I misread. It says the bottom line is that it is God's written word, not someone's personal prefer preferences or prejudices that must govern God's household and its leaders. And again, we can't have hasty appointments. We, we can't make speedy appointments. We need to be careful not to be overly anxious in appointing uh, a new elder or a deacon. A good rule of thumb is that no one, no one should be considered for this office of deacon who's not already serving as an active member of the church and who's not known by the congregation, you're gonna notice, uh, especially you elders and you leaders in the church, if you're looking for leadership in your church or are looking for deacons, they're gonna be leading, they're gonna be deaconing, I, I use the verb for deaconing, they're going to be deaconing before they're even called to lead or be, be deacons. So you're gonna notice that and you can call, you know, then you can, you can groom them, you can bring them up and, and teach them and train them. And, and help them to understand what their possible role to be in the church. Um, again, uh, we don't want to make hasty decisions. Such unwise practices, uh, they directly violate the scripture's warning not to appoint or lay hands on a person quickly. Again, in 1 Timothy chapter 5, verses 22 and 24 to 25, it says this specifically. It says, don't be hasty. Do not be hasty in the laying on of hands. That the sins of some people are conspicuous, going before them to judgment, but the sins of others appear later. So also good works are conspicuous, and even those that are not cannot remain hidden. With that said, no one should be appointed to an office if the church has not first invested the time and the effort properly to properly examine this concept of the candidates' characters and their credentials. We have to be careful, no hasty appointments. So how do you install a deacon into office? Well, after a prospective deacon has been approved for office, some form of public recognition is always in order. In the early church, the laying on of hands was used to publicly install the table serving seven into their new positions in Acts 6. We see that, it says these they set before the, after they chose these seven, they set them before the apostles and they prayed and they laid their hands on them. The installation of a deacon before the congregation by the laying on of hands or any other means the church desires to use officially and publicly places that person into office. What it's saying to the newly appointed deacon is you now officially begin your responsibilities you now have the authority to do the work of a deacon. You can now use that title of deacon. You have important work to do. So installation of a deacon says to the congregation, here is a new deacon to assist your elders in the care of God's church. This person is biblically qualified and approved by the church and its leaders. So you've gone through the process. So here we have a new deacon. And he's been approved, he's been examined, and he's ready to serve, ready, he or her. So think it through uh, and make it better. To conclude then, in all matters per pertaining to this ex specific examination process, approval, and the installation of a church officer, we should always follow the scriptural principle that all things should be done decently and in order should be not hasty. We shouldn't be running, running to conclusions. First Corinthians 14, 40. We can always make it better. We need to fight against the tendency to be thoughtless, lazy, or irresponsible in this examination appointment, appointment of your elders or deacons. So we got to be careful. Um, very crucial. And uh, I, I hope you uh, pulled some very important lessons from these uh, the session tonight, because uh, 
what it really uh, encouraged me when I finished up this course, we did this back home, is that it helped me to realize how important the responsibility of being a leader in the church is. It's not something any of us should take lightly. It requires a process, a scriptural, a biblical process to help us understand uh, what it is and how it is we are to uh, uh, qualify and examine our, our, our deacons or our elders, either way. There's a process and we need to follow it. So think it through and make it better. So some key points from this last lesson for the evening uh, for us to take with us. Uh, first, we see that the process, this process of examining a deacon candidate, it requires time and effort. It's not something we, we can just run into callously and be lazy about it. it it's, it's the same as it is for an elder. It's as important to examine deacons and to, and to qualify our deacons as well as it is for our elders. We saw that the Greek verb, which is translated tested, or dikamazo, means specifically to make a critical examination of something, to determine genuineness, to put to test, to examine. It's the responsibility of the overseeing elders. Remember, it's the elder's responsibility overall to oversee this process, to initiate and supervise this important process of finding training, examining, approving, and installing new deacons. But it isn't their responsibility only. The congregation must also be involved. The examination of a prospective deacon is to be also be a public affair, not a private decision made by a few people. The congregation is not to be passive in the examination of its officers. We need to be actively involved. And number five, we need to continue to sharpen and improve our procedures for selecting, examining, training, approving, and installing new deacons and understanding what a deacon is. I hope this is helping you. Next week, we're going to look at managing, uh, has to manage the family, as well as um, what are the rewards? There are rewards that come with this uh, position. So uh, looking at uh, managing household and family and, uh, uh, and rewards. So with that, uh, we will finish for the evening. And I'll close my share. And we still have 20 minutes. If we'd like to have some discussion, I open up the floor and I'll sit back and, and uh, I'll get involved if you want me to. <laughs> but um, I will leave it to you guys to, to ask questions if you have any. We have 20 minutes, so we can talk. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Brad. And, I hope it wasn't too overwhelming. That was a lot of information I know. Any sadami no no. Sadami. Ang bigat no. Ang bigat ng ano ng requirements to be a to be a deacon and an elder. Elder and a deacon. So mga katanungan po. Any additional additional explanation additional question. comment <laughs> questions clarification from the group anybody so what we have this ang ating didiscuss ngayon ay uh, napaka bigat so first, I discuss natin ay caring of the God's church. So these are example of example of different uh, ministry na ginagawa ng deacon sa church, right? Then discuss natin yung mga uh, qualifications na napaka napaka bigat. Then uh, paano ang examination and uh, select selection of of deacons. Siguro pagdating natin doon sa ano sa RRC, ang gagawin na lang natin doon is sharing of the different practices ng church, no? Kasi tatlong topics na lang analysis for sa Saturday. Then pagdating sa RRC, yung mga incoming deacons at saka yung mga deacons na <laughs> matagal ng deacons. So sharing of their practices sa bawat church. Tapos, ayun. 
no? Then pag maka then magbubuo tayo ng ng Fritz Diaconal Ministry. So yan ang ating gagawin. But before that, so any questions? Any 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 additional additional input from our pastors Pastor Melchor Um uh Madam Pray Mahirap sa ano sa new church plant you Kailangan pala may turo ka God about uh, elders and deacons. Kasi ang ginagawa, uh, pag nakita mong active, masipag, uh, uh, yung ka God, temporary, ma-assign. Mm -hmm. wala, wala ang mapagpipilihan pa. So it takes time, it takes time para mag magapili. Hindi dapat uh, hasty ang pag-assign, uh, pag, uh, paglagay. Yun lang ang napansin ko. Kaya nga, kaya nga po, di ba, sa mga bagong, sa mga bagong church, ay uh, wala pa silang usually deacon at saka elder. Deacon at saka elders. So ang binubuo lang muna nila is the steering, di ba? Steering committee. Ah, yeah. Opo. Steering committee lang muna. And after mm -hmm. that, ang iba, usually kapag once na talagang na-organize na sila, so ayun. Tasted na. Oo. Oh. Oh. Kasi ma mahirap mag, uh, ano, mahirap mag alis kapag uh, ano na pala, uh, na-install mo. <laughs> Hindi rin, basta-basta pala yun. Oo, dapat na-install na ang deacons, once a deacon, forever deacon, di ba? Di ba, Pastor Gerald? Once a deacon? Kasi may deacon and office, maka yung deacon na, let's say, inactive na sa office. So, Ate Pre, uh, it's gonna be a problem here in uh, Paliparan. Because uh, just like what uh, Pastor Melchior said, when we are just uh, planted the church in its uh, pioneering stages, those who are very much active, diligent, and serving first, we have chosen them as part of the steering committee. But since the organizations of the church taking so long, most of them are not here in the church anymore. <laughs> and those who have been left are... Uh, not that active anymore. They don't want to participate or sometimes cooperate in the activities of the church because uh, the resource that they are too old and they have done their part. Mm -hmm. Now we have new breed of uh, deacons and elders, but uh, we need still a lot of training. So yeah, that's the, the church... The church is about to be organized. Mm -hmm. That's why we have been invited to attend these uh, sessions, these uh, trainings. Okay. So I don't know what could be our uh, position when we have been uh, organized or so-called organized. So can we call them deacons now or just uh, practicing uh, elder? I can on my part, I could assure you know, our uh, committee that these ladies that are in, Saira, Ati Belinda, and Ati Mirna, on their part, I could uh, assure them that they are really a deacon's material. But my, I have two young, um, young men that I'm training as an elder. So I just call them practicing elder or uh, whatever I can call them. So what can you advise for us? I, I would say, you know, there's a lot of flexibility except from the actual qualification level. 
Um, the scriptures seem to be awfully clear on qualifications. Now, titles are another thing. Um, I, I, it's it really, you know, and I know I'm in a different culture here than I am back home. And so I have to be careful. But also, we have to also be careful that we follow God's word, of course. That's always important. So I, I tread lightly. I don't, I don't want to make comments that might be offensive. But on the other hand, there's clear, clear visions within scripture. And I think what we need to make is a distinction. Titles are titles, but responsibilities are different. And, and when, when, you know, we're all servants, like I said, and, and, and Alexander Strzok emphasizes that well, um, you need to train up your congregation to understand you're all here to serve. Every one of you has, is required you're part of the body of Christ. You're here to serve the, the community. And if you can instill that and train your people, they'll begin to understand, I think, some of these biblical principles. If these principles haven't been put into place, they're going to be hard to implement. They're going to be, it's, it's going to take time. But you develop that over a course of time. I think training, like you said, Gerald, is a very important aspect of it. Um, having some kind of a training available um, when you're when you're growing your church or now you're going into organization yeah it's these are all critical things i i don't have specific answers and i think there's like alexander says in the book there's a lot of flexibility except when it comes to the qualification aspect. those seem to be pretty clear distinctively and to be careful on those but um to put a title on somebody you know just because they're serving to call them a deacon i think you have to be careful of that. that's all I don't know. You're the the elders. The leaders are the overseers. They're the ones that implement these. Uh, you have to read the scriptures and discern it. Let's all be good Bereans and see what the scriptures have to say. And then we have to put some of our suppositions. We got to put them on the shelf and consider things maybe from a different perspective and a different. I, I only because I see things from the outside. I, I think I have some confidence in being able. Address that a little bit. Not that I would dictate to any of you what to do, but I can see it from a different perspective. You sometimes have to step back and take a look at it without the, the baggage of presuppositions. I call them presuppositions. Where you, you come in with a set of values. Wow, I can't change. I've been this way all. We've been this way all of our all of all the time the church has been here. I think openly. I guess is what it is. I hope that helps. I don't know if it does. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it does, but uh, the constraints is one of the qualifications for the church to be called organized is you must have at least two elders or uh, and deacons. Well, the plurality aspect. You're yeah, yeah. The plural, the plurality it's, of best, I, you know, it's best to have a plurality. I don't think you're not going to, if you're just one person and you're starting a church, you got to, you, you know, you got to read between the lines a little bit. Yeah, if, you only, if you only have one, one person, but you've got to be encouraging as you grow to, the, the, the reason for plurality is mutual accountability. You do not want one person running. That's the bottom line in that, that whole concept is not one person being able to to lord it over the whole church. You want to be able to have at least two to be mute so that you can talk and discuss things out. Uh, there may be cases, there may be situations where that's not possible. But I think in the future, as the church grows, you need to consider that. It's, it's like counting the money, for instance, like we shared tonight. Uh, counting money, putting one person, it's not good for that person to be alone in that concept of counting because he doesn't have anyone to hold them. They don't have anyone to hold them accountable. They would prefer, I know I would, if I were in that situation where I was the only one counting the money, <laughs> I would want somebody over me watching. I wouldn't want to be you know, called out down the road or even be tempted to, to maybe take some of that. So I think you know, time will help you in that area. Yeah, but uh, as I've said, I clearly understand about the plurality of the leaders. 
But uh, right now, my concern is much more on being an organized church and you need to have a former leaders to present that they will be the one that will uh, back you up as uh, co-leaders in the church. That is a, a number one uh, qualification to be called an organized church. Huh? You have so, to, yeah, how can we... Call these uh, leaders, can we not call them now deacons or uh, elders? That'd be up to you. Uh, you know, if they have, if they're qualified, you know, what are their qualifications? Do they fit those qualifications? I don't know. Anybody have an answer to that culturally? Because I'm outside that venue. I don't, don't know. Sonny, Pastor Sonny? Yeah, um, I have a comment on that. See, just like uh, our church, we have we had a transition from the former uh, church into a reform. So we start all over again. What I'm suggesting is, just like uh, what we are doing right now, you have already uh, an existing, a trustworthy workers with you. No, just like Saira, I know I know Saira very well. Uh, you could start with a few deacons you can start a deaconess you can start a few deaconess in your church just like what i'm doing in our church today i require them to finish our uh, statement of faith we include it in our uh, church membership class because we revise our statement of faith from pentecostal into a reform one so everybody is doing it so after uh, the membership class, we, we uh, oblige them to attend this seminar. So they will uh, have a full understanding that uh, to be a deaconess or to be a deacon and even elder is not just a position. Mm -hmm. In some other churches, the church I belong 20 years ago, those who were installed are only after the position and as you can see they lord over uh, the members of the church and that is not uh, that that is not the case in our time today they could easily understand the requirement and it's very hard it's very hard and they should protect the church they should protect themselves no because um, if they will not protect themselves the church will be uh, will be uh, put into a shame no mapapahiya ang iglesia mapapahiya ang ating gawain so they must be careful about it and i i do believe that this is a good uh, transition for each of every one of us uh, so pastor gerald maybe you can start with some few who are trustworthy I guess you can also you can already install them as uh, deacons. Okay, thank you. That's all. No, I think that's good. Thank you, Pastor Sani. Then my uh, follow-up questions. After this, what is uh, installed for our leaders? Do we have a line of uh, curriculum for our training to train our leaders continuously? There, there's a program of, I have already shared it with Leo, um, the same organization that Alexander Strzok has a website. You may want to check it out. Biblical Eldership. Just type in Alexander Strzok Biblical Eldership and it'll lead you to his, his uh, website. He has a resource for training and uh, me and Leo are looking at that and we may be able to implement that here. So we're, we're, we're going to look at that. I think that's an important, con that's what, the problem you're having, I believe, is not having the training available. You need training. And, you know, to establish the training, you need a you know, system. <laughs> so yeah. we'll, we're, we're, we're working on that. Hopefully we can come up with something. Okay, thank you very much. And maybe uh, in the future, uh, we can merge we can have a deacons uh, each churches of the fridge can have a deacons a deaconess fellowship in the future yeah. excellent yeah yep. i think that's a great idea we will do that once established among deacons about member ng fridge 
Yeah. Uh, they need uh, somehow an insight on how to generate uh, <laughs> money yeah. donations because sharing uh, <laughs> of sharing of yeah. their best practices or not really the best mga practices sila sa church yeah. experiences. Para, uh, may we not have a, just like a monthly juice for every church? So we could uh, start a fund for our uh, for preach, especially for uh, deacon's purposes, for trainings. That's a great idea. Yeah. Maybe a, a percentage or whatever yeah. amount can a church can give. Budget yeah. again. Siguro yan ang discuss natin pagdating sa RRC. Yes. Yeah. Yung talagang ano na, yung... <laughs> I discuss natin yung mga programa tsaka yan. Kasi nung, nung dati nung sa sa uh, CRC no? Uh, from the different uh, church members ng ng CRC noon kumuha ng mga ano, kumuha ng mga deacon sa bawat member church at nagbuo uh, ng 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 isang ano, tatawag na diaconal ministry. Then may may ano may tama yung Pastor Gerald there is a parang percentage from the from the church 2% of 2% of their tithes or what no uh, na binibigay dun sa ano sa let's say preach so preach fund for for the yakonal ministry so diyan papasok yun para may funds for trainings ng deacons yes. Any party? Uh, Madam Pre, it must be included um, in the next uh, agenda of our preach leaders. Opo. Pasok nila. Opo. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Oo, kasama yun sa agenda. Kasi isasama sa agenda ng, ng deacon sang ano eh. <laughs> Ang retirement ng ating mga pastors and uh, uh, mga pastors natin. Sama yan sa pa uh, natin, sa programa natin. Sa deacons. Yes, Pastor Kevin, you're raising. Yes, Pastor Kevin. Uh, uh, yes po. Uh, good, uh, good evening po. Uh, tanong ko lang tanong lang po ma'am uh, please please uh, na halimbawa po ano uh, uh, naka-install ka ng ano ng deacon then after five years six years ay lumipat po siya ng ibang church tapos uh, kasi yung installation natin deacon once na install ka ng deacon forever deacon ka ano po yun kapag siya ay lumipat, still deacon po ba siya? Deacon? Kasi sabi, once you are deacon, you're forever deacon. Nga lang, yung sa office, hindi na inactive na siya sa office as a deacon. Kasi may office of the elders tayo sa pa-office of the deacon sa church. So yun yun yung mga active, uh, active mga leaders ng church. So if, if, if inactive ka na, or let's say, uh, hindi ka na voted as a, a, a deacon ng church. So, deacon ka pa rin, but you are not in the office of the deacon. Tama ba? Pastor Melchor? Right? I think, po. I think po. that is right, uh, Madam Pre. Uh, sa, sa party ng tanong ni Pastor Kevin, since uh, naglipat na pala siya, naglipat ng church, uh, ang kanyang pagiging deacon sa nagsis ng kanyang pagalit sa church. So hindi na depende na yun sa kanyang bagong uh, church kung makitahan siya ng uh, uh, possibility ng pagiging deacons. <laughs> hindi, hindi niya pwede dalhin sa kanyang bagong church yung kanyang designation. 
Kasi inactive na eh. Inactive uh, uh, na sa office sa Badikon. Yes. De, unless na yung pupuntahan niya ay kinikilala din yung uh, church government na pinanggalingan uh-huh. niya na merong deacon, may elder, may form polity. Uh-huh. And with your ano siguro, endorsement, kung naging maganda ang inyong paghihiwalay. Pero kung aalis siya na hindi maganda ang inyong paghihiwalay, hindi siguro magandang ipadala rin sa kanya yung title niya na ikaw ang nagbestow sa kanya. Uh-huh. Right. So, dapat, eh, oh, kasi may mga church tulad ng pinanggalingan nila Pastor Sani, hindi naman pre-nactic yung deacon and eldership. So mabaya doon siya pumunta. So hindi niya rin madatil yung title niya sa deacon. Oo, oh, kasi wala din. Hindi kilalanin. Pero kung pupunta siya, ba, sa Presbyterian or sa ibang kumikilala doon sa tinatag na reform polity, mm-hmm. reform government, so pwede yun unless na maganda yung paghihiwalay niyo. So pwede niyan dalhin yun. Pero pag hindi maganda ang paghiwalay niyo at umali siya ng walang endorsement mo, so parang hindi rin maganda na dalhin niya yung kanyang pagiging ko na ikaw ang uh, nag-install sa kanya. Pastor Sunny? Yes, Pastor, Pastor Bernard. Pastor Bernard. Hi, Pastor Bernard. Hi. Yeah. Hi. Uh, our office as deacons and elders, you will be called deacons and elders as long as you live that's for life yep. but when you transfer to another church mm. you uh you are not a uh, you are not a deacon in the sense that uh un- unless uh you have been accepted by the church so by title you're a deacon but by office yes. to serve as a deacon in that church it has to be Uh, yeah. agreed by by the leadership of that church that you transferred with. So a pastor will always be a pastor. An elder will always be an elder. But the pastor who transferred to another church, he must be called by the uh, that church for him to be the pastor of that church. But by title, he will always be a pastor or an elder. You, Pastor Bernard? Yes, Mr. Pressy. <laughs> <laughs> Who else? Uh, yun na, klarado na, Pastor Paul. Opo, salamat po. Salamat. Thank you po. Oh, any other questions? Sa las ocho na po. <laughs> I have to close. <laughs> Pero po ba sasabihin si Sister Vicky? Itatanong ko ba kayo? Wala na po. Klarado na. So marami pa po tayong pag-aaralan. <laughs> About the deacons. Okay. So kung wala na po, it's 8 o'clock na. Yeah. So let's ask Pastor Melchor to close us in prayer. That would be great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Grant. Yes. Um, <clears throat> thank God. you for another uh, evening. So let us pray. Salamat po tayo, our Heavenly Father. Kami po ay alubos na nagpapasalamat sa panibagong aral sa karagdagang kalaman, Panginoon, na inyo pong patuloy na binibigay sa bawat sa, sa amin upang uh, mapaayos, upang lalo namin, Panginoon, magampanan ang mga katungkulan na ipinagkalob mo, pinagkatuwala mo sa bawat sa, sa amin upang ang inyo pong iglesia ay uh, mapangalagaan, hindi lamang, Panginoon, sa maling katuroan, kundi maging sa mga taong naghahangad, Panginoon, nasirain ang uh, iyong uh, pamilya. Sa gabing ito, aming amahan, dalangin po namin ang patuloy mong pagkalinga uh, sa bawat sa, sa amin at sa amin pong manggawain, Panginoon. 
kay po uh, mag-ingat sa yung mga lingkod, sa yung mga pastor, sa yung mga deacons, mga elders, Panginoon, at sa amin pong pagtungo bukas sa mga gawain mo, Panginoon, sa amin pong mga iglesyang uh, pinaglilingkuran, kayo ang patuloy na tumulong sa amin pong baganda upang ang anumang gawain na gagapanan ng bawat sa sa amin ay amin pong magawa para sa kapurihan ng inyo pong pangalan. Sa amin pong pagtatapos ngayon, dalangin namin ang ma ang iyong patuloy na pagkalinga uh, patnubay at uh, lalong higit Panginoon ang mga lingkod mong mga maghayag ng salita mo sa araw ng kinabukasan, iba yung pagturo, gabay at uh, kapangyarihan na nagbubuhat sa banal na espiritu ang siyang manguna at gumabay sa iyong mga lingkod. Tulungan mo rin ang mga kapatid, ang iglesia na maganda sila para po magpagtagpo sa mga lingkod mo at sa iyo, Panginoon, sa araw ng bukas. Ama, salamat po ang lahat ng ito, aming hiling at tinadalangin na may pasalamat sa pangalan po ng aming Panginoong Hesus. Amen. 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 God bless you. Thank you, Melcher. Say, can we get a screenshot? Can we get cameras on so I can take a picture? Okay. And then I'll share it. Cameras on. Basta yung inyo mga kam. Magwapo natin at ang gaganda natin. Oh, yeah. Let's go. Okay, get them all tonight. Nice. Cameras on. If you can. All right. I'm going to count to five. Get ready to smile at five. One, two, three, four, five. Smile. All right, one more. All right. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Grant. Oh, thank, thank the Lord. Thank, sir, um, um, thank you. So, Marvin, SFCC, sorry. see you tomorrow. Night. Thank you so Night. much, everyone. Thank you so much for the last